Thanks everyone for coming uh, to the second edition of the Open Source Contribution Panel. Um, so I'm really happy to have you all as panelists um, and you as an audience to discuss about open source contribution in our daily business, in our private lives. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I want to open it uh, with just a quick introduction who you are and what's your first memory with contributing to open source and what motivated uh, you to participate in open source contribution. Um, yeah, my name is Josef Tavernik, I work at Unic and my first memory of open source contribution was uh, in Nicaragua where I helped uh, co-organize uh, the first Drupal camp there and it really inspired me to be able to connect with so many people from local communities. So that's why I'm here. I'm Bon Zivanovic and I am the project, project lead for Drupal Commerce at Centauro. Uh, my first experience of contributing was I was 13, I was using GNOME and the new browser at the time didn't have a website. I was learning HTML so I figured I would create something for them. It was terrible. So I show up at the mailing list and I say, oh look, here's a website I'm proposing. And they tell me it's terrible and they show me there's a group I can join. And I realize open source also has a process. You can just not code on people. For, fast forward a few years later, I started messing with Drupal and I started to base my first module, so that was Drupal 5. And it escalated from there. My name is Michael, I'm the CTO of the Amazing Group. Um, yeah, my first experience, I think, was DrupalCon Denver at the Code Sprints before the event. Um, yeah, there was a guy there, his name is John Albin, and he, he, I walked in and he said, like, do you know responsive? And I said, like, yeah, I've done some responsive stuff. So he gave me a code, uh, like some code to review, and I did it. And then at the Sprints after that, it was live committed on stage by Dries. That was the first time that Drupal had the responsive stuff in there. That was Drupal 7, and that was my first contribution since then. Yeah, that started the whole thing, and yeah, today we have whole companies that are based on completely open source and everything. Uh, hi, I'm Julia, and I'm the community manager of the uh, Thunder distribution, and I'm the non-technical part of the Thunder team, so uh, no coding at all. So my first contribution was um, being track chair to the DrupalCon uh, this time, and so I got the first credits for my team, and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Sally Young. I'm a senior technical architect at Lullabop. If you haven't heard of, we are a Drupal agency. Um, I, <laughs> the official uh, version is that I contributed the smiley pack for PHP BB 1.0. So if you've seen like the green guy with the grin that's still everywhere, that's me. Um, <laughs> the unofficial version goes back a bit further is more embarrassing. I used to be really into Friends, the TV show, and I used to hang out on the, the forums there. Yeah, and uh, I got really into the forum software. So we used to hang, hang around on those, they were in Perl. It's before patches, so I used to write forum posts explaining where to copy and paste things to people. I'm old. <laughs> wow. Nice, thanks everyone. So, um, I think Julio, you mentioned you're the newer contributor to the team. Um, a few of us, we have, let's say, maybe a, a few more years of experience. What's the biggest blockers that you have encountered so far when it comes to contributing? And how have you overcome them? Maybe we can start by Julia. Um, for me, it's uh, I think two aspects. For one thing, I'm not developer, so this whole um, infra uh, infrastructure uh, that's a bit of um, well, I was afraid of it. Don't understanding things, don't understanding issue queues, um, how things work, what are tickets, uh, how are these things actually working? That's everything new to me, and. Um, these are things you work every day with, but for a non-technical person, um, it's, everything is new. So really everything is new. Um, I learned about GitHub, about merging things, pull requests. Everything was new to me. I've never heard these wordings before. Um, what really helped me was um, the contribution sprint. But it was no longer called code sprint, but contribution sprint. So I first realized that I can do something as well, me as a non-technical person. And um, 
a lot of people helping me. Um, I think a buddy for a great thing, and um, other people from the people agencies we work with who um, ask for my help. So I get the feeling that I can do something because before I just felt well, there's no place for me contributing. No one's interested in what I can do, and um, I really appreciate that now. Um, there are also ideas of um, giving credit to people uh, doing all the non-coding work, like organizing or helping organizing events and um, reading uh, texts, um, things like that that are not coding. Somebody else wants to follow up. Where are the diggers, smokers? Um, I was just really intimidated by everyone. Um, everyone seemed so smart, and they were always talking about lots of things I didn't necessarily understand. Um, and I just thought if I threw my hat into the ring, I'd get laughed at. Um, and actually, that's one of the reasons as well. I never used to use my real name on the internet because I didn't want people to find out who I was and just be like, who's this silly little girl trying to help out? Um, but I, I think over time I realized even if someone's posted some code on the internet, it doesn't necessarily mean they know what they're talking about either. Um, and when you realize that, like everything changes. It's like, uh, yeah, you can feel free to throw stuff up. People probably aren't going to laugh at you. Um, and they will hopefully take you seriously. That's how mostly they do. Yeah, I think for me it was similar that at the beginning, yeah, you feel like you don't know anything. And I think going to events and going to the contribution days and actually realizing that the people behind all these usernames, behind all these many contributions that they've done on Tripolidoric, they're just regular people. And talking to them and understanding that they're super grateful um, for you to help. So I think that was really nice. And um, specifically, in my time, I helped uh, out in the multilingual initiative. And that was Gabor that basically just was there all the time, and um, if you had a question or if you didn't know anymore, um, yeah, you go to him, and even if it was a silly question, he helped you. And I think that's what I, what we are now trying to do is to be open, and if somebody comes, really try. I think that was the, that's a big step for somebody to ask for help. So make sure that if somebody comes for you to help, that we are open to them, and even if it's a question that we answered already a thousand times for that person, it's the first time. So that was for me really nice what I had at that time, and I'm trying to do the same now. For me, back when the game was still virtual, when I was disconnected in Serbia, the, the trouble was understanding that there is a process, that a process needs to be followed, uh, and that that process is going to take more time than I anticipated. Just because I got something to barely work doesn't mean that it's finished or that it's immediately going to be accepted. And I think uh, many of us have had uh, this experience of frustration at an issue taking too long or uh, one of our ideas just uh, taking too long to be accepted. Cool, thanks. Uh, when you look at or yourself or maybe the people that you work with, what strategies do inspire you that help um, embracing open source work and also into the personal schedule or the work schedule? I think for me, it's really about getting people to not only contribute once, but to make them to understand that it's really a process. Like, like we just heard that if you just write one patch one time on Drupal.org or any other um, open source um, uh, contribution, it's nice, it's, it's great, but it's really something that has to come on. So explaining people that they should really like either follow the issue if somebody replied to them, that they should go back or on, on GitHub. And I think that's really the the part that I think if we as, let's say, business owners or so, it's not just like trying to do one day contribution, that's, that's nice, that's awesome, but it's really a process that has to continue and that almost has to happen almost every day. It's just a couple of minutes maybe to reply shortly or to test something additional, but it's not just going in and doing one thing is, is not going to be very successful and rather trying to yeah, tell people that um, also that they should focus on one part. Like, um, you cannot do contributions to every part of Drupal. Like, um, so, but if it, instead, if you try to focus on 
or try to find your own special idea or things that you want to get really good in, that is going to be a much better experience. <coughs> And to follow up on that, I think that both as individuals and as companies, uh, we need to create the time for open source and uh, for following the process. It's not just about uh, contributing when we have time, but it's also <coughs> time that needs to be created. Just like we do not do security or reviews when we have time, we accept that it's a fundamental part of the work that we're doing. Same with being a part of open source. I do a lot of client work, so for me, I always try and make sure that my clients understand that um, the contribution is important. So if if we're working on something and we fix something for Contrib or Core, and that patch goes back to Drupal, it's still part of our work to help get that into Drupal as well. Um, it will make the maintenance for the client easier later on. If it's already there, they're not going to have to apply a bunch of patches or maintain a bunch of forks. Um, for their code base. So uh, if once you've posted the patch, even if you've done that as part of your client work, it's still ongoing and still part of that project. And so I, the people I work with, I, I hope I can uh, impress upon them that it, you don't have to now maintain this for life in your spare time. If you're still working on this project and it's still relevant, you should still be doing it as part of this if you have the time. I think it's a lot about finding the field where you can make an impact, and, um, where you feel like you can be the expert and you can really help and do something that, uh, and then you feel valuable and not feeling like doing an impact, and that's a good thing to understand and that helps to get into that. Thanks. Um, so I've kind of chosen you because I know you, but I also know your companies. Um, each of them like has a little bit different approach to open source. Like, what do you think um, sets the approach apart from, or like, what do you really like about the open source contribution approach that you follow um, in your companies? Could you maybe explain that a little bit? Well, Centauro's case might be a bit different. I know every company likes to say they are open source first, but we really grew out of open source in the sense that. All of us started by contributing to open source projects, making money from open source projects, and then deciding to create an open source project that we and others could profit from. And because we started from that, uh, it, it made sense that we always thought about open source first. Even if we are doing something with limited use to others, we will still do it on Drupal.org. We try to make sure all of our processes are uh, transparent. Uh, and I, I guess that transparency and that unwillingness to take anything private it is what sets us apart. Yeah, I guess I have two hats on. With one is the, the hosting part, which is completely open source. We actually started them not open source, we started proprietary, but then at one point we realized that first what we have, nothing is really proprietary, so we can open source it, and second is that many of our users that use the hosting platform, they actually liked if when it is open source, they like to see what we're running. And so yeah, we switched over to open source, and like you say, it forces us now to be much more more process oriented. We, we cannot just like release a version without a change log because everybody could see that. And so it's it really sometimes there's times that I'm like, why do we do that all of open source? But it also like forces us to really um, to really use it. And on the other side and so we also have an agency and, and there we really try to to tell customers as early on as possible, like we just heard that a contribution is an active part of it. That um, that the customers cannot even say no to contribution. It's just going to be part of it. If they request a feature and we and it involves a bug or so, that this is going to be part of this. And at the beginning, it was really hard, but now customers actually like that. They understand, and they almost start to request from you that if you write a patch for a for a contrib module, that it has to go back into the code because they realize that this will make the maintenance easier and all that stuff. So it's really trying to teach the customers more and more what that when they decided to use open source it's not just a decision to use free software but this actually also includes a lot of additional work 
to make it better. Um, the Thunder Distribution started as an internal project of the German publishing house who got Buddha Media. And um, when we open sourced it, uh, we kept this kind of uh, centralized, decentralized strategy. So we have the Thunder Core team, which can focus um, well, completely on the Thunder distribution and on um, working on the distribution and on the modules and on core and everything we need. And our units are doing the project. So um, that's a very good situation for our team because they can really focus on contributing and on uh, making Drupal and to core and uh, content modules and everything we use better. Um, that was uh, special for us. Um, so at Lullabot, uh, we only work 13 client hours per week, and then the other 10 are for internal. Um, calls and whatnot and whatever you want to spend your time on if that's learning things. Um, open source contribution is encouraged as well. Good song. Semi-final. <laughs> um, yeah, so some people at Lullabot will spend that time uh, contributing. Others won't. There's no sort of pressure to do it. Um, we like to share what we've learned a lot. So um, you can subscribe to our blog. We love to write about all the things that we've learned. We also have a, a side company called, uh, they changed their name, like still think of them as Triple Eyes Meet, and they are now called, help. <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. OCO Labs, that's it. Um, so yeah, we, we like to teach and help that way. Um, but we, we definitely don't pressure people to do it, which I think is really nice, because I've kind of seen other companies where they're just, it's what I mentioned earlier, like you make a patch, but I, I would feel bad if people I work with then felt obligated to have this burden of ma maintenance around their necks like for the rest of their lives and their free time. So we don't really encourage that kind of stuff. That's a nice segue. Uh, so um, to, today we had uh, breakfast and, and Julia mentioned that uh, um, she now realizes how much history some of us already have with open source contribution and when we brought up the topic about uh, that, that people get burned out because maybe they, they feel obligated to maintain the projects and the projects are growing. Um, so yeah, how do you all deal with burnout situations or what strategies do you see in the community uh, for people to take better care of themselves when it comes to open source contribution? I feel like a lot of the burnout is unavoidable because we are in such situations where there is always a lot of responsibility in a small number of individuals. But actually one of the best ideas I've read recently was the Lullabot article uh, that talked about setting expectations, which for me is the most important part, communicating uh, to people what they can expect from our project and how they can help. Uh, is this a weekend thing for me? Am I just sharing something cool I've done? Or is this perhaps a core part of my business? Am I looking for funding or am I looking for a job? Or am I just looking for more people to contribute code? Uh, and uh, I, I think it helps a lot because we admit not just to others but to ourselves what we're pre prepared to do and how much uh, we are prepared to commit. But also at the same time I think that uh, that we need to resist the urge to constantly market our projects. It's fine if our project is not for everyone. It's fine if people sometimes choose a different solution because we cannot be everything to everyone and we cannot destroy ourselves trying to be that. Yeah, <clears throat> I think about making expectations, adding to that is also, that's something I had to learn myself, is not to be afraid to say no. Like, if somebody asks for you for a feature on, let's say, on the Drupal issue queue or somebody brings up a bug and you really don't have time, what I used to do is just like ignore it and hope it goes away and it doesn't because it just comes back and you every time you go to the issue queue you see it again and it brings back that like, oh no, I should work on it but you can't and so, and just going in there and saying, look, I don't have time and close it off and like get over it, I think that's much better because for the person that asked the question, they know, or for them, staying in limbo is also very hard. Like, will it ever gonna be done or not? 
So I think that's um, that's really just if you don't have time, you go in and say, I don't, I, it's not going to be me, close it off. If somebody else wants to help, great. But I think, uh, yeah, so try to say no or learn how to say no, that's a big, a big part that will keep your sanity. <coughs> Um, I I'm fairly good at walking away <laughs> from stuff, so I I think if I'm getting a bit bombarded by things, I really don't have a problem ignoring them, um, which probably isn't very responsible maintainership. But I also don't feel obligated to random strangers on the internet to look after them. Um, I uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm very tired. I haven't like my coffee yet. There was something else, but maybe you say something and I'll try and remember what it was. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't remember. <laughs> um, it's not like, don't, it's kind of what Bojan said, like I don't really feel the need to grow things all the time. I also feel like that a bit with the Drupal project, it's always like the goal is we have to get bigger all the time, otherwise we're a massive failure. It's like a very uh, capitalist view on things, I suppose, but I'm just, I'm happy if there's a smaller number of people who are, you know, pleased with using Whatever it is I'm working on, I don't really feel like I need to take over the world with my JavaScript library or whatever. <laughs> uh, I remember when I when I tried to push contribution for for the teams I worked with, we we came up with systems like okay, we match the time that you spent in your private life with the time that you can also spend contributing. And when I look back at those ideas uh, and decisions we took. Um, I think it's also really a bad practice if we expect people to spend their private time um, because you know people have families or other duties or maybe people are even not privileged uh, so that they have so much uh, free time to spend on open source contribution and that's also a topic that has been uh, featured more and more in the last years. Um, do you see examples or do you have ideas how we can make our contribution space more diverse, uh, with relying less on the privilege of people having free time or, or paid jobs? I think for me, the, the most important one is um, accepting that code is just one part of the contribution. And I think that's one thing that we at the company try to really do, so that if, if people say, I would like to help, but I'm I don't want to write code, but I can organize an event, or I can take meeting notes of a of meeting, or I can go to Drupal.org and do translations. Like There's so many different ways of contributing. And I think just saying that and telling people that contribution is not about code, that's one part. I think we have to be much better in the Drupal community to, um, to um, with the, all the credits and all that system, to make sure that this gets um, recognition, but I think just opening that up um, already helps for people that maybe say they don't want to do the code stuff. Um, and I think that's yeah, I'm giving like people time. I think that's really cool. Like hearing that other companies just give you ten hours for, and then you can decide within that to do, um, because it's really something that needs a step by step. Like you can't expect of somebody doing a keynote at a DrupalCon as their first contribution, that's not gonna work. <laughs> I mean, you can try, but... Um, so yeah, just... And allowing people to also, like, talk about their successes and failures. Like, if something was really stressful, talk about it. And, um, yeah, give people time to grow. Um, I can only kind of talk about this within the context of Drupal. Um, so it's not too generic, but I... I think we need to uh, stop trying to build so much community consensus on every little thing that we do. Um, and by that I mean, uh, say a proposal has been made for, for something, but then you have to spend time fighting five loudmouths in the issue queue who have infinite amounts of time. And I think there's always this expectation that we have to make sure absolutely everyone is very happy with what we're doing before we're going forward. Um, and I, I think sometimes we might get better results and allow more diverse people to, to participate in those if it didn't require such huge amounts of time to like, appease everyone. So I think 
having some more leadership, like leadership could have a little bit more push on directions that we're going in. Um, I think it helps to um, to live the things we're talking about. So it's for me, as uh, a more technical person, um, it's fine that everybody says that you can contribute a lot with code, but uh, really, I really understood that when uh, people did that, when I was at a triple con and saw there was a table, it was about marketing. I'm like, oh, okay, they really meant what they said. And um, I realized what I can do. And what helps as well is, um, from my perspective, that what we said in the beginning, sometimes you are afraid because you don't know if what you do is good enough. Um, maybe, uh, I thought about it, it would help to have like a mentor you could ask before contributing to the whole world. So is this enough? Is it fine? And people would say, yeah, of course it is. But I'm not brave enough to just well, scream it out into the world, here, have a look, but I've done no, no. Okay, I think a lot of people don't are that uh, brave. And uh, maybe it would help to uh, have like a, a step in between so you could uh, ask like a tiny group or a mentor um, and get one opinion about it. I think that attracting new contributors, including new contributors, is a skill of its own, and the Drupal community is going in a good direction in that sense. I mean, it's not simply about telling someone, you know, drag up a chair and start typing. Uh, there needs to be a very active effort to help someone learn how to contribute and, and learn what they need to do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that many of us have been in this whole thing very, very long. Uh, I have, and I'm not from an underrepresented group, uh, which means that we will always benefit from trying to get more feedback from the people who are new to this, who are underrepresented, uh, and then see how, how we can improve the things that maybe we cannot even see. To add as well, it's all like very well attracting new contributors, but you need to make an environment that's nice for them to stay in. So if you know people who are having really shitty behavior, you need to go out of your way and call them out on that, um, or call them in. Um, and you know, don't pan around on Twitter with people who really suck, you know, because it just like, it's going to make people from underrepresented groups not feel safe in your community. So. Everyone needs to participate in making that happen. Um, could you share a highlight, maybe when you look at the last weeks, um, some nice achievements that you have seen, made maybe by your peers or by the community that you think uh, we can be proud of in terms of contribution? Yeah. <coughs> Most today. Uh, Claro got in. Um, which is really cool. So it's the new admin UI uh, as an experimental module. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> um, so you can go check that out. I was like only peripherally involved in it because it kind of came off the um, JS admin UI, but it's been amazing to see all the work that that team has done. And uh, we've been using it on the prototype as a current project I'm using, and every time I get a new update through Composer, it just like looks even more incredible than before. <laughs> so they've done such a great job. For me, it's the media initiative and all the other initiatives our team is working on, and uh, to see that their work, their work is um, well, that things are happening there, that's really great. For me, it's this event. Like there is a lot of change. Like for the people that maybe know, DrupalCons used to be very differently organized than this one, and just seeing the advisory committee that I was part of, but also all the track chairs. Uh, because there was a lot of like unknown and things organized in last minute and people really stepping up and doing stuff in a really short amount of time that we usually had months for, now we maybe had weeks for. And just just that's the really nice thing I, for me to see that so many people are coming together and, and accepting the fact that it's going to be, well, meetings are going to be horribly misorganized and chaotic at the beginning, but if we all work on one common goal, we can make such an event happen. And I think that's, that really showed me that, that that's like, I don't know, it's hard to say, but that's what the community is really like, that, that common 
plus that, that swarm knowledge or that swarm power that we have working together, that's just every time is so crazy to see and that one single person could never do it, and, but as a whole we are so strong together, that's really nice to see. I must be predictable here and highlight the triple commerce community because it's incredible to me to see the 1500 people on the Slack channel helping each other, exchanging code, advice, bringing each other in and teaching and just being self-sufficient. And yesterday I randomly walked into a commerce buff and it had over 50 people there. It was led by Brad and Eric and it, it, it was just magical to see just how self-sufficient and amazing they all were. Cool, thank you. Before we open this up, maybe for a few questions from the audience, the last question from my side is, uh, what's something that you haven't figured out uh, yet for yourself when it comes to open source contribution? It's something that you would like to, yeah, to make a step ahead. Saying no. <laughs> I was like, this DrupalCon, because I'm only involved in like tons of stuff. And I was like, okay, this DrupalCon Europe, I'm gonna do nothing. Nothing at all. No no talks. And I'm sat here right now. I ended up helping with the track chair. I'm emceeing on Wednesday for the trivia night, so I come to that. Um, <laughs> and I was like, the chill DrupalCon idea has just gone completely out the window. So yeah, I need to say no. Any tips on that? Please let me know. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to um, convince publishers, uh, well, not developers, but uh, project managers, product managers, uh, and some publishing houses to not only use open source but also contribute. figure out how to focus on the positive more than the negative, on what we achieved and not what we still need to achieve. That might be more of a personality trait thing, but also very often when we come to these places, we tend to focus on everything that still needs to happen. It's normal, but sometimes that too can bring our motivation down, or maybe just make us too worried. And it's always a marathon and never a sprint. Uh, so it, it, it makes sense to ensure we can survive the next decade doing this. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to decide which one I pick, but then, um, it's actually about uh, focus. Like, it's just, it's so easy to do a lot of things at the same time, and I realize that if you do that, that all of it goes down, like the productivity in total goes down. So I think. It goes back into saying no, but also saying no to yourself. Like that, it would be really cool to now work on that, or it would be really nice to now do all of these other things, but just saying, I can still do them, but maybe later, right now, I'm focusing on that part. I think that's what I personally struggle a lot, and it has definitely there were times where I was better, and I would say right now I'm horrible in it. So, yeah. yeah, I can definitely agree. Yeah. Focus, saying no, that would also help me. Are there any questions from the audience that uh, we were not able to cover? Please use the microphone. How do you, sorry, how do you stay motivated? i uh, when I do things with open source, it usually ends up with being a very small, uh, doing a very small thing <coughs> that scratches an itch and then losing interest because there are like a hundred other things that also interest me. How do you keep your motivation to work on one specific thing and bring it to the end? Figures? <laughs> <laughs> to me it's a lot about making the, the chunks of work small, small enough that I, I can get immediate pleasure from completing something. So that means instead of planning this six month effort in my head that's going to destroy me in three months, I need to figure out what I can do today or in this hour or in the next 30 minutes. And then after that, figuring out what my recharge cycle is. Sometimes if I complete something that was long and hard, I need to focus on a quick win to get myself started again or vice versa. So it really depends. I think it's a lot about listening to ourselves and how we approach work in general. Yeah, maybe adding to that, um, what I try to do is just accept that sometimes 
your work or your week will always consist of positive and negative things. And what I try to do is like at the end of a week, uh, pick a date, whatever, the weekends, and I try to like look back at the week and see like, do I overall, did I like that week? Because I think focusing on one individual piece can be very negative, like we just heard before. And if I tell myself, yeah, the last week was overall positive, or I overall I liked that week, then I just continue. Or sometimes I really feel like, no, that was really bad. Or in overall I'm not happy, then I try to change one piece of that. But I think, yeah, just accepting that sometimes you have meetings you don't like, or you have work that you don't like, and <coughs> I'm trying to look more as like as a whole thing than individual pieces. I'm at the very beginning of my journey and I'm still highly motivated. Of course, they saw. Well, I really like the idea that I can make an impact, that I can change something, and well, being part of something bigger, I really like that idea. <laughs> I'd say it's okay to not be motivated to follow through on things that like you put something out there and you probably help someone else and that's fine and if someone else wants to use that and pick it up it's you know don't feel obligated to, to have to do that forever um, on the other hand if it's something if it's something that you think would be worth following through on because you have some other goal in life like I want to. I want to learn this particular system, and contributing in these ways will help. Then I, I think if you, I don't know, write it down on a piece of paper or keep it on your desk or whatever. And if if the things that you're doing are going to help you with that goal, then great. But if not, then yeah, don't worry about it. It's fine. Any more questions? Yeah, stand up. Okay. Um, okay, so it's moderately a two-part question, and. And it's going to get a little bit to what, what is it, Yulia? Yes. Okay, what, what you had said earlier. So there's a few things that we, we have done in the Drupal community and the open source communities at large have attempted to do over the years to recognize and give credit to those who contribute. So for example, Drupal.org profile has what you contribute to and how many commits that you put it on and docs and things of that nature. We try to put them up on the keynote uh, uh, like the trees note and, and list some people there. So that's one part. It, and then bleeding into the second part, and I'm going to ask you sort of what you feel about these things, is that's the community trying to give credit to those who contribute via other ways, you know, some recognition. The other part is how do we help publishers, project managers, product leads, non developers, non contributors, or non community members? recognize how important that contribution is. So I'm curious from a con contributor standpoint, what of those things, whether it's the profile or the keynote speech or things that has resonated with you and said, hey, that was a really nice symbolic gesture or a really nice gesture, something I couldn't have received without contribution, and could any of those be used on the other side with business owners and leads and people paying our paychecks to want to say like, oh wait, I want to keep paying you because you do that. <laughs> Did that turn into a question? Or <laughs> I think there's multiple facets to that. Yeah. I think from a business point of view, I think we need to do, and as an agency now, I think we need to do a much better job in explaining our customers what it actually means to, to use open source. Like, to explain them that it's not just software that you get somewhere and it's perfect and it will have bugs and they need to be fixed, but that they that, that you need to contribute back. So and I think for many of our of the customers, they have no idea what they're actually getting into. And, uh, and on a positive thing, like not I not I don't want to say that open source is the bad way, but just making sure that they understand how this community works and maybe bring them to these events, like we tried that, it's hard, but we, we succeeded and these relationships with the customers definitely have been much, much better. So that's like the business side. And the other side, I think, if you are in decision, or if you are in a position to decide to use somebody else, let's say you, you hire an agency to, to work for you, maybe right in there that 
you expect that agency to do at least X amount of contributions, or you expect for them to, I don't know, go to DrupalCon, or like just adding these, and these, these are tiny small pieces that we can do now, but I think over time, more people will start to expect or to, to make contribution part of the choosing a company or choosing an employee. And I, I feel like it's, it's something that's gonna take years, but it's small steps. So we're almost out of time. Last comments from each of us? Mm. Um, I would like to add that um, explaining that is a big part of my job. <laughs> explaining open source and explaining that it's not software for free, but it's high quality software because we have this big community. It's, it's, that's the point of open source. It's not for free, but that's not the, that's not the point. Is that you have a big community, an active community, which helps you. That's the point. It's not cheap, it's high quality. And I try to explain that. And what we do is uh, also um, what we said, uh, well, helping the makers so, uh, by uh, talking about it, talking about contributions they do, about modules they do, about uh, things they do, so people will learn about it. So, um, and that's well, what we try to do to help contributions as a Thunder team, as a marketing kind of the team. <laughs> um, I think the credit system has a lot of really big flaws. I don't necessarily know how, how you could do it better. Um, oh gosh, so you, you kind of have the same problem with GitHub, like people are looking at people's GitHub profiles and if they're not like a sea of green, then they think like maybe this person isn't worth hiring. I think that's a really bad um, way of doing things because like obviously we don't all have equal amounts of time to spend on GitHub or Drupal.org contributing things. I also know the credit system gets gamed by you know people making much smaller uh, like spelling corrections as opposed to someone who spent like a really really long time fixing like a multilingual system or something and they're not really fair comparisons to make either. Um, the other side of that is that I know some companies will pay people to work on core because it will help them get up the marketplace because they'll have more issue credits but then that means you've got people on Drupal.org with not necessarily any kind of thing that they need to get fixed for, for someone's actual website so maybe that's not a great thing either because they've just got infinite amounts of time to you know write essays and stuff on issues um, but then I, I, I think like that there's not actually many people who are in a position where they can get paid to work on court either um, I really like when we highlight people in the community um, through keynotes and presentations and stuff like that as for a better I, there are some good parts of the credit system too, and I really like the way that we're accrediting people who organize events and attend meetings and everything now as well. That's really good. But I think uh, yeah, the other system needs an overhaul somehow, but I don't know how to fix it. Shortly saying that there is an issue on Drupal.org that talks about that, so if you have opinions, <laughs> ideas, solutions, go in there, because I think, yes, I agree, we should make it better. It's very meta. It's contributing to the yeah, yeah. contribution credit of crediting the contribution. And you will get, you will get, and you will get credit <laughs> to the credit system. Yeah. 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 Would you do a system or the old system? Okay, last comment. <laughs> <laughs> I think it wasn't immediately obvious when we were creating the credit system that we were creating an economy. We were creating a currency, and we need to be careful about protecting it from inflation. We need to be careful about how we distribute value, and that's going to be a very difficult discussion. And it's not something we can improve by doing quick fixes and changes in the middle of the night. So it needs to be a discussion, and see you on the issue. I would like to thank all the panelists for speaking. for participating, feel free to um, continue the discussion. Um, thank you thank for you. organizing this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Genau, wir hätten gerade noch mal erinnern. Wir hätten Mountain. Ja, ja.
Ja. Genau. Es war ein kurzer kurz bei mir, Philipp. Sorry. Ja, ja, ja. Es war ein kurzer Aufstieg bei mir. Mein Vater war schon krank. Ja. Darum musste ja. ich mich nicht mehr. Jetzt hast du auch recht organisiert. <lacht> genau. Ja, schön bist du da. Ja. 